Federalism is a concept, is a mode of governance. Mode of governance in countries and societies which have multiple identities. And most of the big countries where there is a diversity, they have a federal system of its own, whether it's USA, uh, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's India, uh, Brazil, uh, Germany. Uh, though Germany doesn't have the same characteristic, each federation is different in some ways, but each one of them have this distinctiveness that the states are quite big and, and there is a, each state has a distinctive identity of own. In the USA case, it's because each state got integrated as a part of US uh, through different means. Sometimes it is captured, sometimes they are allowed to uh, come. So it is, it is a mode of governance which allows accommodation. That it's, it's, it's a negotiated accommodation and, and sometimes it's iterative. You don't, you don't know the end, but you, you know the process that there has to be negotiation, some concession by the centralized administration. And part of the reason is that you need a centralized administration because the nature of the economy, sometimes political and ideological, as we will see in the case of India, but sometimes purely a necessity of economic administration, you need to have a centralized uh, uh, administration. But then because of the distinctive identities, identities could be based on the, uh, based on religion, it may be language, it may be uh, uh, ethnicity, um, it could be, you know, their indigenous communities and who have a different culture of their own. So di different kind of entities, so they have to uh, negotiate. And negotiation takes place in two ways. One is a negotiation with a center, but it's also a negotiation between the states. So there are two terms which people in federalism study use. One is called vertical federalism, other is horizontal federalism. Vertical federalism is where you are th th thinking only about the states and the center. And the horizontal is where you are thinking about the relationship between the states. And as you will see in India later on, both these are important in understanding the crisis, problems, contradictions of uh, Indian uh, federalism. Now, <clears throat> India as a federal or centralized entity before the uh, British rule. India wasn't really a very centralized administration. Mughal rule, which lasted for many centuries, was quite centralized. But there were also high degree of autonomy within the, within the uh, uh, Mughal rule. And uh, by the end of the Mughal rule, in fact, number of sovereign states had uh, uh, developed. Uh, we all know about Mahana Singh's uh, regime, which from 1799 to 1849, for 50 years, Punjab existed as an independent sovereign country with its own flag, with its own territory, with its own army, with its own currency, and so on and so forth. But Punjab wasn't the only. Tipu Sultan Mysore was an independent sovereign country. Uh, uh, Nagpur was, Ahmedabad was, uh, Hyderabad was, uh, Aud was, they are all independent uh, uh, states. And uh, when the British took over uh, India, uh, they started from one part, you know, the West Bengal, east, east, east uh, of the country. And they start leave, started acquiring. Punjab was one of the last, not the last, but one of the last. It was uh, taken over in 1849. And of course, all was taken over afterwards, and there are a couple of other states which were taken. But then finally, by 1857, it was centralized administration. So it's quite ironic that when we talk about colonial rule, British colonial rule, it is the British colonial rule which actually made the idea of one centralized entity. Before the British rule, there wasn't one centralized identity of, of the territory which we call uh, India. So when people talk about decolonization, Decolonization should also mean that the emergence of those independent states which existed before, before the uh, British came. So, so um, those who kind of keep on talking about uh, decolonization, they don't recognize that British administration in fact contributed to the centralization and the making of what is called the nation. And out of that came the national movement. National movement of independence which came was obviously because they wanted to have one nation but the idea of one nation came because the British had already integrated different parts of the uh, uh, country into it. So next, <clears throat> um, um, now, I mean, before I come to the fourth, the, the other point was about the British, that British also had a lot of accommodation. One of the accommodation which they did was, they did not directly integrate the princely states. 
princely states were given a some degree of relative autonomy in collection of revenue, collection of uh, the, the, the management of the administration and the spending power. Some of the uh, states even had the army. For example, I come from a small village, I mean, where I was born in Freedcourt, uh, uh, princely state. The Freedcourt Raja had its own army. And actually from the village I was born, there were people who actually were recruited into the army of the uh, Fleet Court state. And many of these princely states then also used to contribute to the British army. So they had their own army, but they also used to contribute to the uh, British army. So British, British did make accommodation and that was the nature of accommodation, uh, nature of British colonialism. And just one point on this, that British colonialism was very different from say to compare French colonialism. British, whatever differences existed, they accepted this. They did not try to homogenize them. French on the other hand, wherever they went, Algeria is one example, but other countries also, wherever they went, they said, you are a part of us, you are French, okay? On one hand, French administration looks better because they say French language, we are promoting French language because we want to consider you as an equal. But when it came to the question of independence, British were actually more accommodating because they had already recognized you as different. They were actually willing to give you independence. French were much more ruthless. Therefore, French were extremely ruthless in curbing uh, independence movements. So there are two, two different models of uh, uh, colonialism. But British state, despite being centralized, had a very strong component of accommodation with distinctive identities. So then, um, yeah, next, yeah. <clears throat> Then the negotiation leading to 1947, that what's going to happen after British had left. The biggest problem was that the Muslims were very worried that when India becomes independent, it will be a democratic country, governance will be by vote, and Hindus will be in a majority, and maybe there will be vengeance against us because Muslims have ruled during the Mughal rule for centuries, and, and therefore they were very worried. But it's very important to note that the demand for Pakistan was not the starting point. Jinnah actually wanted this, that those states where Muslims are in a majority, they should, they should have a relative self-administration. Self they can be part of the United India, but they should have a greater degree of autonomy. And that meant Balochistan, Sindh, uh, you know, Pakistanistan, that area. Punjab and Bengal were a bit controversial because in Punjab, the Muslims had majority of only 55%, Hindus were about 32-33%, uh, Sikhs were about 13%. And uh, <clears throat> Jinnah was actually arguing for uh, some kind of an accommodation, some kind of a confederation. So he wasn't asking for, uh, uh, um, you know, partition. That's why the Indian historiography does great injustice to truth when it posits Jinnah as evil, that Jinnah had a two-nation theory, he of course had a two nation theory, but two nation theory did not mean that he wanted, you know, a separate country. He wanted to live with that, but also a certain degree of uh, 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 autonomy. Um, but the, the rulers who were going to become rulers of India, they were not comfortable with that. And that is, that came number five, cabinet mission plan in 1946, which was promoted by the Prime Minister Attlee at that time. They, they said that what we should do is that we will give you independence, but in that independence, large amount of power will vest with the states. Central will have minimum powers, mainly in those areas where only central administration, for example, foreign relations or currency or the administration of railways, which require countrywide network, uh, defense. Now, these are central subjects, but all the other spheres, they will be given to the states. And uh, um, this was not acceptable to Nehru, especially Nehru. Nehru was the most centralist, but also supported by Patel. And Gandhi reluctantly eventually supported uh, him. Nehru's idea was that we wanted to create one nation out of diversities. He was aware of diversities. He was aware that there's a large part of the country which is non-Hindi speaking. There are Sikhs, there are Muslims. There's a Muslim majority, you know, province of Hyderabad and uh, also in Jammu and Kashmir and the southern uh, region of the country had a different culture, different history. They did not like the domination of Hindi. Their own languages were highly developed. For example, Tamil had a long history as much more developed language than Hindi had. 
and and so that was one reason uh, that why Nehru wanted a more centralized administration because he thought a strong central state will be used as a lever to weld India into one nation. Secondly, Nehru was a great votary of planning, and this was because if you remember the period in which this was happening, late forties, you know, uh, early mainly late forties. This was a period when the world had gone through Second World War and before that it had gone through a Great Depression of 1929-33. The kind of Great Depression which the world has not witnessed. Even we have had recessions but nothing like this which has happened. 1929-33 was a major depression where there was a mass scale unemployment, where uh, goods were being produced but they were not being bought and people were becoming independent, factories were closing. And out of that came the Keynesian idea. Keynesian Keynes was a very famous British uh, economist who, you, who argued about the need for a public sector, who argued for the need for state intervention that you can't leave it to the market economy. And already in Soviet Union, under Stalin, industrialization had been a success, though very brutal industrialization, where agriculture was uh, destroyed, peasantry was destroyed. I mean, horrible atrocities were committed on the peasantry. In, in, in Russia, but Russia did industrialize. That uh, there is a speech of Lenin, a speech of Stalin, where he is talking to industrial managers. He says, "Comrades, what the West has done in century, we have to done it. We have to do it in a decade." So agriculture was squeezed in in in, in uh, Soviet Russia, but the industrialization became an industrial power, and they were aware that we are surrounded by all these hostile powers. Similarly, in this country, there was called Fabian socialism. Fabian socialists were a kind of variant of uh, Gandhism, uh, of, of Keynesianism. And Nehru was quite attracted when he was studying at Cambridge to this Fabian socialism. So he wanted central planning. So he knew that if you have a, a confederation where states have a large degree of autonomy, then you can't have central planning. In order to have an effective central planning, you need to have a strong center. So from the viewpoint of economic administration, from the viewpoint of economic governance, he also wanted a strong center. He did not want a uh, uh, weak center because then he would not be. His idea was that if we have to develop India into one nation, we must take care of this, that there's a huge amount of economic diversity. There are some regions which are highly underdeveloped, others are well-developed, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Bengal, Bengal that time, they were highly industrialized states because they were poor towns, you know, and, and, and during, the, during that period, the sea transport was a major uh, form of transport, and that is, that is one indication of the success of British colonialism, that they have a very good navy, and, and that's why they captured a large part of the world, and the technology is very important to understanding why British uh, became a successful colonial power. So, um, uh, you know, the, he was aware that there is a huge amount of diversity and unevenness. And this unevenness need to be taken care of in order to develop as a nation. If some states remain backward, they will start feeling dissatisfied eventually. Therefore, we need to use the lever of central planning to push central investment into those states which are poorer states and not put investment in those which are highly developed. So again, we need a, a, a centralized uh, a planning. And Patel, of course, strongly supported him. Uh, he, he wasn't much of an economic thinker, but uh, he certainly believed in the idea of creating one nation. Gandhi reluctantly, um, you know, he wanted to keep the Muslims, but eventually he, he went with them and therefore the partition took place. So the point which I'm trying to make is that the creation of Pakistan is not because of the evil genius of Jinnah. Jinnah was actually pushed into asking for Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan. He was quite happy. He did not sell his house in Mumbai. His sister lived there for a long period of time. He even thought that even this partition will be temporary failure, he would become a reunited. So it is the it is the obsession of the central rulers, and I have done you know long chapter on this on, on Nehru's role in this in my book. And uh, uh, in one one paragraph which I've quoted. Nehru actually heaves a sigh of relief that Pakistan has been created. Now we can get on with the task of centralization because if we have to keep the region which are with Pakistan, we'll have to accommodate them. 
and if you have to accommodate them, we can't be centralized. So he wanted to have. So very strangely, I mean, he was happy that Pakistan is, you know, Muslim majority areas have gone. Now the Punjab and Bengal were uh, uh, different. That uh, in 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 Punjab, as I said, Muslims were about 55, Hindus were about 32, 30. When I say Hindus, I include both upper caste and uh, lower caste Hindus, and six were about 12 to 30, 13 percent approximately, 13 percent. And uh, Jinnah offered the six that if you agree to Punjab going to Pakistan, then the whole of Punjab will go to Pakistan because 55% plus 13, there will be nearly 68. And they will say that we want to go to Pakistan. So the whole of Punjab, Punjab will not have to be partitioned. Sikh leadership was quite puzzled. They wanted an independent Sikh state. The idea of Sikh state, Khalistan, came in about 1944-46, that if the India, which might be called a secular, they might be saying it's a secular, but it's a Hindu majority country. Pakistan is clearly a Muslim majority country, though it's also, also important to remember the first speech of Jinnah when Pakistan was created, we say that, yes, Pakistan has been created, but now everyone will be equal. There will be no discrimination of the base of religion. He also wanted to project that. So, but the problem was, and the English were not hostile to the idea of the Sikhs. They recognized the Sikhs are caught in this, that the Muslims are going to get Pakistan one way or the other. And of course, the rest of India will be Hindu majority, but Sikhs are going to suffer. And the British administrators at that time were quite sympathetic to the idea of accommodating some way or the other Sikh interests. Part of the reason was that large number of Sikhs had served in the British army. So they felt indebted to them that you know, large successes the British rule in many parts of the world, in Singapore and Malaysia, even in the Second World War, they went into France, that they have served us well. But the problem was demographic one, that six had majority only in two tessils, in, in Tantan and Jagrao and Moga, one of the two is kind of uh, questionable. There was no other area in which six of majority. They were 13%, but they were spread all over, the all over Punjab. And part of the reason was that during the British rule, the Western Punjab had a huge territory, but not very well populated. So British had developed canal colonies and they had led to migration from the densely populated districts, Ludhiana, Jalandhar, and they were taken there. And also that those who get recruitment to the army after they retire, they will get Murabbas there. You know, they will get the land. And this is nothing unique to British. Uh, all rulers in, in previous decades used to give incentive to the peasantry that if you join the army, you will get land. You know, Napoleon did in France. And and so um, the six was spread in Mentgumri, Rawalpindi, you know, uh, Siavkot, all, the, all those areas, uh, you know. And, and uh, <clears throat> I went to Pakistan twice. And it is amazing to see the number of people who actually appear to be Muslims, but they're actually not Muslims. And I gave a lecture in Islamabad once uh, to the press club. And there's one gentleman who came to me and said, uh, um, Satsikalji, and he had a kada wearing. And he had kind of almost tears in his eyes. And I kept eager to see him, but I'm upset. Kandaji, I'm not a Muslim, but I'm not a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. So I said, really, that's interesting. He said, we were very rich landowners. He decided that, you know, the choice is to lose all this land and remain a Sikh and migrate to East Punjab or say that I'm converted and, and keep the land. So he said he opted for the second, but he had a guilt throughout. And, and, and but he told his father, that's my father, that you always have to wear kada and you always have to go at least one visit to Ramadar Sahib. And my father passed on that. I wear a kada and I always, I have not only once, many times I went to Ramadar Sahib. And I have four sons, all the four sons have been indoctrinated. They wear kada and I've told them that you know. So there is, there is, there is a very complex uh, phenomena which uh, 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 took place as a result of this. So therefore, the demographic factor was not in the favor of creation of a sixth state. So therefore, the partition took place, the large-scale genocidal murders of, of uh, Muslims in East Punjab, 
and Sikhs and Hindus, mainly Sikhs uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Pakistan. And Rawalpindi was an area which was inhabited heavily by the Sikhs. There's a civil lines area in, in Lahore, very beautiful area. And I, ha I was invited to a dinner and the person was a professor there. He said, all these, all these houses you see, they were occupied by Sikhs, you know. And I said, man, Lahore is a beautiful city. Sometimes I wonder if I want to retire, I might want to come here. And, and so, you know, they, 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 and the Sikhs also try to argue with the British that, okay, our population is less, but we contribute more to the tax revenue, okay? Because they were well off and they were landowners, business, business people. So that should be also taken into consideration, but eventually demography went against them. So partition took place and India emerged as very highly centralized. Now the Indian constitution number six is a highly centralized constitution. There's a misconception which is spread that it's a federal state. Federalism was introduced during the emergency which Indira Gandhi imposed in 1975. She, she, she inserted two words, India is a federal and a socialist country. It is neither federal nor socialist, you know, and, and uh, uh, so it wasn't originally conceived. In fact, Nehru wanted even more centralized state than it was. For example, Nehru wanted that any amendment of the constitution can be done by a simple majority in the parliament. Ambedkar was quite clever. Ambedkar on one hand was in favor of a centralized state. I'll explain in a minute why he was in favor of a centralized state. But he was also very worried by the Nehruvian uh, outlook. The simple majority can change the constitution. So he insisted that there must be two-third majority in the parliament in order to make a constitutional amendment. So that it becomes more difficult to make an amendment. And Indian constitution is the most amended constitution in the world. It's not my word. Meghna Desai, who's also done study on this, he's, he said that, and which is absolutely right. And, and so it's a highly uh, 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 centralized uh, constitution. There are several aspects of this. One is promotion of Hindi. Now, Hindi is not a national language, but it's an official language, and and uh, which is which is not, not normally recognized. The people say that it's a national. It's not a national language. It is an official language. Means it is a language of exchange between the state governments and the central governments. But the southern states protested against this. That they said we are not going to have the correspondence in Hindi. So English has been maintained. So therefore, English and Hindi both uh, remain that. But also in promotion of Hindi, one of the clauses of the constitution, I have written a paper on this Hindu bias in India's secular constitution. If anyone of you are interested, I can, I can email you and, and uh, <clears throat> I'll WhatsApp you. And, and uh, uh, that it's the Sanskrit vocabulary should be used in order to promote Hindi. So it was not only the, the, the Hindi language, but Sanskrit version of Hindi, which was. Again, the question of Bharat, when, when India was named India, and Bharat. There was a lot of debate in the Constituent Assembly. Some, some southern states were opposing this. That should not be called Bharat because Bharat is associated with Ramayan and, and you know, it's the nation of the old Hindu empire. And of course, uh, 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 a centralization uh, aspect of that. And I've, I've dealt in great length in my paper, but part of that is produced in the book also. That. So it's a highly centralized uh, 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 constitution. And uh, then with, with that centralized uh, 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 institution, because India is one of the most diverse countries in the world, there's no other country in the world which is as diverse as India. It is, it is home to at least six religions, okay? 28 languages. And of course, there are 28 states and seven unit territories. Each of those states have a distinctive identity of their own. So even Nehru had to make concessions. One of the concessions was, it was agreed before the uh, independence that when India becomes reorganized after independence, the states will be reorganized on a linguistic basis, that each language will have its own state. But Nehru changed his mind. He said, no, we are not going to have linguistic states because that is a concession we gave at that time. But then there was a demand in Andhra Pradesh, Telugu speaking state, they wanted to have a separate Telugu speaking state independent of Madras. Madras uh, province was the United Province. And Romulu was a Telugu leader who went on to fast and he died. And there were riots in Andhra Pradesh. So Nehru had to agree. 
and similarly gujarat was created out of bombay and therefore you know bombay province was divided into gujarat and maharashtra but nehru in his own lifetime did not agree to the demand for a punjabi speaking state there is a statement on the record of the parliament where he says i will never agree to the creation of a sikh majority state on the border of india now it's a quite a significant statement to me which means that if this was a hindu majority state i might have agreed if it's on the border of india okay and and um, i will not agree to, and in fact there was a socialist leader shok mehta he reprimanded nehru in the parliament he said what kind of secularist you are the whole of india is hindu majority and one part of india if it becomes sikh majority you are thinking this is against the unity and integrity of the country you know and and so it is very interesting that during his lifetime punjabi subah was not created and also because master tara singh was more master tara singh was very selfless leader one of the most selfless leaders sikh community had produced and there are various stories about his selflessness and i i don't want to take more time and and how much time i have about 5 6 okay oh, really 5 6 minutes i have to carry up then okay so i i will not go into that so it was a very highly you know centralized state so but in terms of the development strategy from 1947 to 1991 it is nehruvian vision which i have already told you that nehru wanted regional inequality to be reduced and and india emerged as a strong nation and one of the ways of reducing regional inequalities was that state should the central planning commission will have the authority so in my book i detail how very little public sector investment came when i was doing the search on the book i met one industrial uh, uh, and development officer in punjab he said that don't uh, take a copy but don't give my name ever but he showed me the documents that the punjab government will put up a demand for a sugar mill or a cotton mill and verbally they will be told no only one word no it not be allowed because they argue that punjab has developed as an agricultural state it has a high per capita income we are not going to be doing more industry so punjab remained agriculturally oriented state till now and less industrialized as a result of that so then uh, yeah next then post 1970 came the liberalization which is kind of negation of nehru in model manmohan singh uh, did it and uh, which is to open india to external market and also introduce the private market within 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 uh, uh, india but important thing is that many people thought that since central planning is being abolished this will lead to more rights for the states okay because central planning was the instrument which was leading to centralization so central planning is going to be abolished but actually it did not happen that even in liberalization after liberalization central state even became more part part of the reason is that in the global economy in which we operate finance has become very important so you know more than industry and agriculture financial services have become very important and in this obviously the reserve bank of india has a controlling power okay and therefore you know in the financialized world central powers are increased they have not decreased as a, as a result of that then bjp comes to power in 2014 and there has been increasing centralization the citizens amendment act 2019 which says refugees coming from afghanistan bangladesh pakistan uh, if they are six hindus parsis they will be given citizenship but if they are muslim they will not be given so very blatant uh, discrimination Uh, article 370 amendment uh, which was given self rule to uh, kashmir that was abolished they might have to you now retract back and excessive promotion of hindi and and uh, um, which against there are kind of uh, gst which is general uh, tax general goods and services tax now this is important from the view point of economic governance one of the most important uh, source of revenue for state governments was the sales tax when people buy thing there is a sales tax and that comes to state governments that was taken over by the central government now they take it out and then give it to the states so states actually have been reduced into beggars now and sometimes they delay the appointments so this was another way of centralization and uh, then now there is a move to synchronize state assembly elections and central government uh, elections and the reason is that bjp calculates it may may, may prove right or wrong that if they conduct the elections at the same time 
the regional parties don't have same level of resources as they have so they will be able to win even the state level elections because they have enormous amount of resources and 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 yeah next okay there are emerging contradictions in this kind of centralization which are taking place one is of course fear among religious minority and dalits and uh, the 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 upper caste sentiment during bjp rule has become very very strong and therefore uh, discrimination against the dalits have been very of course muslims christians and sikhs are in a peculiar state on one hand bjp wants to show that sikhs are a part of hindus and 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 you know we are not going to launch any aggression against them but on the other hand in the last few days this you know canada row has led to whole media being whipped up this frenzy on the khalistan issue so one might be you know thinking that it's going to be repetition of what indira gandhi did to target one minority and uh, so um, fear among the religious minorities north south divide is probably the most important contradiction the southern states which are five states tamil nadu uh, karnataka uh, telangana andhra pradesh and which is the last one um, there are five i've forgotten the fourth one karnataka 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 yes yes karnataka they are the most prosperous states in india okay their per capita income is very high compared with say bihar and up which are the northern states and the population growth is low okay and they contribute much more to the tax taxable revenue than up and bihar does and what is happening now is that after 2026 the, there will be delimitation or drawing of the constitutional boundaries that you know it will not be only 543 some parliamentary elections they want to say that the each state must have number of uh, uh, parliamentary seats according to its population the population of up and bihar is increased massively but the population of southern states is declining or it's a very low rate the reason are purely economic that this is a worldwide phenomenon wherever economic development takes place and women's literacy is higher birth rate goes down okay southern states are in that category it's much more tolerant of women much more respect for women much more educated women so the birth rate is gone down birth rate is very high in up and bihar so their population has gone significantly so when after 2026 they redraw the boundaries southern states will lose about 18 parliamentary seats and up and bihar will get about 24 extra seats so the dominance of north will become uh, even more blatant and southern states are going to protest against this because they are saying that we are being punished for doing something useful that the indian government has been trying to launch family planning measures and we have done the family planning measures so in fact our success is being used against us and the backwardness of up and bihar they are being rewarded with more seats Uh, because they have not pursued this part they have not produced pursued education they have not uplifted to the role of women therefore the birth rate is very high therefore the population has increased so they are being rewarded for uh, conservative uh, policies and then obviously uh, and you know uh, it's a, it's a country with a 27 states and seven uh, union territories and each state is the size of a country just to give you one example UP if it were to be independent country it would be the seventh largest country in the world and and i looked at the other states and uh, punjab if it were to be an independent country it will be bigger than 184 countries in the world and punjab is considered as a small state but actually it is not a small state it's bigger than mizoram is is one of the low i mean it's not among the 28 states sikkim is the lowest 128 Mizoram is the 27th. It's for 1.1 million. Even Mizoram will be bigger than 173 countries in the world. So, purely from the viewpoint of administration, yes, I'm I kind of almost finished. Purely from the viewpoint of administration, it is becoming dysfunctional to to manage a huge country through centralized administration. Therefore, it is an absolute necessity that federal accommodation must come in. whether it happen or not happen we don't know but in in order to survive as an entity making accommodations of different kinds of accommodation is very very important i think i'll, I'll end it here and and uh, i think we should uh,
a lot of time for questions. Yeah? What exemptions did Article 370 give to Kashmir as compared to other states? Well, um, it was a kind of internal autonomy. Originally, the Chief Minister of uh, Jammu Kashmir was, was allowed to be called Prime Minister, you know. And then they had some special rights that outsiders cannot come and buy land there. You know, it's, it, they have special rights as, as, as a result of that. It was a Muslim majority um, um, state. Therefore, certain provisions for spreading of uh, education, they had control over the education. And, and uh, so by creating unit territory, they have taken away, uh, you know, Kash, Jam, Jammu, and, Jammu, and they have taken away Ladakh as a separate uh, unit territory. In fact, it might act negatively because whatever the Kashmir part remains now, it has become a heavily Muslim populated country. You know, earlier, you know, there was a, Jammu has a substantial Hindu and Sikh population. Ladakh has a Buddhist population. Okay, so actually they have decreased, but I think they might undo it because they themselves know that they have done a wrong thing, probably, you know, you know, to, to support the cause of Kashmiri independence. Yeah. Uh, how essentially then is uh, federalism different to the mean value system? Because it seems quite similar, right? You have centralized authority and you have like a bunch of the mean value, but in this case, these states. Yeah. Is it essentially the same thing that's going on by different states, right? It's the mean value, right? You mean that. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the. Uh, so, uh, but so um, how is federalism different to the mean value system? Oh, the mean value system was merely a way of revenue collection. That that uh, there was one zamindari system and then one was a reyotwari system. Zamindari system was more mainly in East India, Bengal, Odisha, where the big landlords could uh, you know organize uh, rent taking from small peasants, and the reyotwari system was where, where people themselves cultivated. So Punjab and Haryana had a more reyotwari system that where the farmers themselves cultivate their self cultivators. There large number of Jamidar did not actually participate in cultivation. They lived in Calcutta. That's why you see Satyajit Ray's films, you know, large landowners in you know, exuberant style. They have no idea, you know, what's happening in the countryside with the land being cultivated because they're all being cultivated uh, by, by, by them. And, uh, but the centralized administration here is very different. British did that because they accommodated with whatever differences existed. They, their main purpose was to maximize land revenue so that they can use that land revenue to fund the army and fund the army to capture other, other, other parts of the world. That was their main, main, main consideration. What other countries come close then to the um, like linguistic diversity, different ethnic groups? Well, um, I, I wouldn't say that it comes close, but Switzerland is an amazing country. Switzerland has four parts. One part is German, one is French, one is Italian, another is Swiss, Swiss German, Swiss. And they have quite a high degree of autonomy and, and in a, each region. But they, they accommodate in such a way, and they are not actually even, even they have no pretense of having one Swiss identity. That they are also called German, in a Swiss German region, Swiss Italian region, Swiss French region and depending upon the area in which they, they come from. So Swiss, Switzerland is quite an interesting example of, of uh, successful federations. All federations are not successful. Okay. Yugoslavia. Or yes, so Yugoslavia is an example of a failure uh, accommodation. And the reason is that under Tito, all the other states were forcibly kept as a part of the unity. Okay, though he himself wasn't at his serve, but serve domination was very extensive. Similarly, under Stalinist regime, Russia dominated the other regions. Okay, but once that's collapsed, the other regions kind of got uh, independence. Similarly, there are other places, Ethiopia, Eritrea has become independent of that. Wherever there is a failure of accommodation, even in this country, if Scotland is given a large degree of autonomy, they may not want to think about independence. Most cases, independence comes when federal accommodation is not allowed by the centralized administration because political reasons, because they want to give in votes of the majority of the other part of the you know, region or sometimes for economic reasons. 
but many times it's a political reason. So people start with autonomy and autonomy can then degenerate into. I have a feeling that if the government proceeds with this plan of, uh, you know, uh, that redrawing the boundaries, election, you know, constituency boundaries, it will have a major protest. Southern states will really, really protest because that would mean that not only language is being imposed on them, they, they oppose Hindi, but even politically they are being weakened. Okay, they are culturally very distinguished. Many of you might have traveled to the South. When you travel to South, you actually feel that you are in a different country. You know, they are culturally so different from the boorish uh, Northern land. Sorry to use this word, and and and, and Northern India. So, um, so um, Switzerland probably would be the closest to uh, that. Um, Pakistan has also quite a distinct identity. You know that you know Sindhis are a very distinct linguistic group. They resent the nomination of Punjabi and Urdu. Uh, Bloch people, you know, they also within Punjab there is Raiki language, which they also say that Punjabi should not dominate over them. And the example of Bangladesh is a very clear example. Again, Sheikh Mazibur Rahman was not asking for independence. He was merely saying that Urdu should not be imposed over us. You know, and Bengalis are language. And, and why should not? And the military state did not agree and it eventually led to a war and, and, and partition. So it's a familiar story that accommodation, federal adjustment, not being kept, then finally degenerates into uh, secessionist movements. You know. Yeah? Uh, very refreshing to hear Frank's statement on Nehru Vijana the reality of how they let down them. Yeah. And it was good to hear, you know, the um, rewriting of narrative of Master Tara saying that has been happening a little bit, but needs to be happening more. Yeah. What about people like uh, uh, Baldev Singh? Yeah. Um, and these people, were these characters just, were they just proxies or were they sold in or what, what, was, what, was, what was their general gist of them? Did they fall into the same category as Master Tara Singh or not? No, Baldev Singh wasn't in the same category. Baldev Singh was a very rich industrialist mm -hmm. who had a lot of business in Calcutta, West Bengal, spread all over. And he was chosen as a kind of Sikh representative partly because he was so integrated into this uh, business. And, and uh, Master Tara Singh was certainly a very selfless leader, you know. I mean, I was saying that I'll tell you a story. There's a meet, there, is a, there is a story of a meeting taking place of the Central Committee of the Kalidal in Lahore. And in the meeting after an hour or so, he says, I have to go to another town. So you, you carry him. So he went to take the bus. And after half an hour, someone realized that Master Ji may not have the, you know, rent money to pay. So someone was sent and he went and, you know, saw Master Singh. He says, I see, I saw that you will pass any home. And the Hamel could pay Tanis, but Master Chakuno come and push on Luga, not a miracle. You know, he was so self confident about his own popularity. You know, and you can imagine that what is the difference between the present kind of leaders and, and uh, but he, he also in terms of vision was confused. He did not clearly say that we want a Punjabi speaking state. Sometimes he will say we, we want a Sikh state, a Sikh homeland, he will keep on mixing with it. That way Sant Fateh Singh despite he wasn't very clever, he made this very category clear that we want a Punjabi speaking state, whether it's a Sikh majority or not, it does not matter. Okay? And, and therefore that appealed to the larger uh, uh, population. And in fact, the Punjab's Hindu leadership has been very, very poor. Punjab, Punjabi Hindus did not have a highly enlightened leadership. If they were enlightened, they would have said that all the Punjabi speaking area should remain in Punjab. Therefore, Ambala, Karnal, Chandigarh, if they all, in fact, the Hindu population would be almost equal to the Sikhs, you know. So it's because the non enlightened leadership, because they're sectarian, they've actually harmed their own interests, you know. Another question. Yeah. 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 Uh, the question. Yes, a lot of this is very descriptive, and I agree with a lot of this, especially like, like their socialist influence, etc. Uh, but what would you prescribe as, like, uh, if you made the key decision maker, how, yeah. how do you reform India given this? Well, one thing I would say is to recognize one is one, one, one is one is very extreme. That's what I would propose. That we should recognize that India is a multinational country. 
is not one nation. But that requires a huge amount of courage. Because any political leader who will say this, they will be immediately branded as separatist or whatever. But it's possible a time might come that we need to recognize that there are different nations within the same entity. In this country, Scotland is called a separate nation. Wales is called a separate nation. They even have separate football teams okay, when they internationally uh, compete. But they are part of the United Kingdom. Okay? So that would be the most, most interesting that we should recognize that there are more than one nation. India is a territorial space, but inhabited by many nations. And we recognize the right of every nation to have some degree of self-administration. Secondly, recast center state relations. The state should be given a high degree of an unpreserved resolution, which is decried very badly. Actually, it's quite an intelligent uh, document. And even the Sikhs also don't know this, that an unpreserved resolution did not come just in one day. There were a 12-member committee who held about 12 to 13 meetings over a two-year period. Okay? Probably that resolution is the most discussed resolution internally. And finally, when it was proposed, except that there's one thing which say that Sikhanda Bhur Bala, there's nothing in that which is, which is, which is, which is calling for federalism. That's why many other parties actually thought Jyoti Basu quite appreciated Anand resolution. Sheikh Abdullah quite appreciated many parts aspect of the Anand resolution. So, but of course you can't restart because so much venom has been you know, spent on that. But a, a vision which allows a high degree of self-rule by the states. And the reason is that education and health are two areas which, allow, which demand very high degree of expenditure. Even in this country, as you know, NHS has a very high degree of expenditure. And the states have to incur that because education and health are both state subjects. Okay. And, but they don't have the revenue. The revenue is taken away by the center, you know, the GST and income taxes all through the central government. And uh, um, the central government has also, I have detailed in my book, they've also made other amendments. For example, there's a corporation tax. Corporation taxes, which is let on corporations. States don't have any role in that. So corporation may be based in Ludhiana, but the tax on that will be taken by the central government. Okay, And then it's a question of how you are distributed. There's a finance commission which does that. There's a formula, you know, there's a debate about it, whether that formula is correct or not. But states have a very little role. I would even go further. I would say states should have a role even in the framing of a foreign policy. I've written an article, but I haven't published as yet, which I'm saying that foreign policy is too centrally controlled because some states which are border states, they have a vested interest in having a different kind of Punjab would not want to have antagonist relations with Pakistan. Similarly, Assam and Bengal will like to have friendly relations with Bangladesh. Northeastern states will want to have good relations with Burma and China. Okay? But foreign policy decided at the and, and daily based uh, level. It's a highly centralized, daily centric administration which does not have the vision of the diversity of the country. So I would say the best would be to recognize that it's not a one nation, it's a multinational entity, but we can still live together. You know, living living together is possible if you make an accommodation. Secondly, even within that, that you go a high degree of uh, self-rule, self-administration to the states and and uh, and giving them the resources or taxable resources. You know. That's a quick couple of questions long. Yeah. Uh, I seem like the line with you on the idea of like decentralizing it uh, yeah. and again central planning. That's why, yeah. you know, why why stop at the states? Why why stop at you're saying that it's a multi-nation country, that like even within the states is the diversity should even need to really within the states. Yes, so, yes. I would say it should go to municipal committees and panchayats as well. The state should decentralize further. And and, and that's very important, the local administration, because they know, I mean here city councils play a very important role, you know. In, in managing transport, man, managing local administration. And though this has been also reduced in this country, also city council powers have been reduced. But this was a good experiment. So similarly, municipal, the state should further decentralize, you know. Yeah. Vaiguji Ka Khalsa, Vaiguji Fateji. I'm really thankful to Dr. Pritam Singh Ji for today's lecture. Federalism is a very important topic. One thing I'd like to just note is Nothing is ever set in stone. Borders are man-made, they're not divine. Borders change. 
Places change, people change. Just look back at recent history, go back 50 years, go back 100 years, things change. If something is wrong for a people, then the people have a right to make that change. If federalism did not work out as intended, the people of that nation have a right to make a change. So I'd like to just once again show my appreciation for Dr. Pritam Singh. There was an interesting point you noted about uh, Sant Fateh Singh. <laughs> I'm going to bring in a bit of history. See this building we're in now? Sant Fateh Singh laid the foundation stone. So it was a burnt out building and it needed to be totally rebuilt. But when they started that work, Sant Fateh Singh actually laid the foundation stone here. So sometimes we've got to look back in our history and find those foundation stones as to how do we move forward. Thank you, everyone.